Greetings and welcome to the United States Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon. My name is Janati Stolyarov II, and I am the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Here we hold conversations with some of the world's leading thinkers in longevity, science, technology, philosophy, and politics. Like the philosophers of the Age of Enlightenment, we aim to connect every field of human endeavor and arrive at new insights to achieve longer lives, greater rationality, and the progress of our civilization. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our special Virtual Enlightenment Salon, our panel on the death of death. Today is May 8th, 2022, and we are pleased to bring to you a discussion which we hope will be of practical significance to all of you in our audience and will help you reach an era of longevity escape velocity where many of you will not have to die at all. So first I would like to introduce our U.S. Transhumanist Party officers who are in this session, our Director of Visual Art, Art Ramon Garcia, our Director of Publication, Zach Richardson, our Director of Applied Innovation, David Shoemaker, our Director of Longevity Outreach, Ben Balweg, and our Legislative Director, Jason Geringer. And our invited guests for the panel today are individuals of great renown within the transhumanist and life extension community. We have Dr. Jose Luis Cordero, who is the author of La Muerte de la Muerte, or The Death of Death. And he is also the technology advisor and foreign ambassador in Spain for the United States Transhumanist Party. He is a man of many achievements, and you can find out a lot about his life and his work on our U.S. Transhumanist Party website. Also, another guest whom uh, we are happy to have with us today is David Wood, who is familiar to all of us as a guest on multiple prior virtual enlightenment salons. He leads London Futurists. He was one of the founders of Transhumanist Party UK, and he is the co-author of The Death of Death. We also are honored to have Dr. Terry Grossman, who is the founder of the Grossman Wellness Center and a lecturer and writer who co-authored two quite famous books, Fantastic Voyage, Live Long Enough to Live Forever, and Transcend, Nine Steps to Living Well Forever. And his co-author was none other than Ray Kurzweil. And then we have Simon Waslander, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of AGI Laboratory Incorporated. He was our previous guest during our Virtual Enlightenment Salon of April 17th, 2022. And he is famous for a TEDx talk that he delivered in 2015 entitled Cocoa Food of the Gods. And he is a great source of knowledge about uh, augmented fasting and other practices for the extension of health and longevity. So welcome to all of our panelists and welcome to our viewers. Let's launch into our discussion about longevity, escape velocity, and the death of death. We'll start with Simon, who will give a brief overview of longevity, escape velocity. Simon, you have the floor. Uh, let me first say that it's such a tremendous honor to be here today with these revered guests, with basically the best of the best in longevity science work. And uh, I hope that we're going to have a very stimulating conversation and to talk about something that humanity, that humankind has dreamed about and only dreamed about since the dawn of recorded history, health span extension, extreme lifespan extension, and even biological immortality, not having to die. It's been a dream for so long and now we are closing in to this dream with uh, breakthrough technologies, with medical science, and with uh, medical publications almost daily now showing lifespan extension. It's a very, very exciting time to be alive. And I really want to ask uh, very well esteemed Dr. Codero 
Cordeiro to explain the concept of longevity escape velocity to the viewers. Why is it so important? And how can we use this to reach an age where we can live forever and have nanotechnology and, and have a really cool time on Earth? Um, fantastic, uh, Simon. It is a pleasure also for me to be here with so many friends and so many longevity leaders. And I am happy also to have my co-author of our best-selling book, uh, La Muerte de la Muerte, The Death of Death in many languages. And I have a nice quotes, testimonials. And my favorite one, actually, uh, is written by Terry Grossman. I will read it in Spanish. Terry, and then you can translate it. Uh, so Terry Grossman wrote, La muerte de la muerte muestra cómo ha llegado el momento de que la muerte pro pruebe su propia medicina. So uh, Terry, because you understand that, you can translate that later. It's a fantastic, fantastic quote. So I'm very, very happy about what you wrote. Now, let me talk about uh, longevity escape velocity. Uh, this is an idea that uh, was developed by Aubrey the Grey about 20 years ago. He began talking about this idea that soon we will be uh, gaining more time the longer we live. Uh, right now, every year we survive, we get about three extra months. And then we will get four extra months and five extra months and more and more so that for every year we survive, we gain another whole extra year very soon. That means that we will basically live long enough to live forever because we gain one extra year per year we live. That is what um, was called longevity escape velocity by Aubrey de Grey and some of the people working with him 20 years ago. First at the Methuselah Foundation, and later at the Stens Research Foundation. It was interesting that at the Methuselah Foundation, they were talking about that. And then another friend called Paul Hinek, Paul Hinek, he said, uh, let's define this in a more interesting way using Methuselah. So let's talk about the singularity of Methuselah, a time when we will be able to live maybe a thousand years like Methuselah was supposed to have lived a thousand years, or to be more exact, 969 years of age, according to the Bible. So uh, this was called the Methuselarity, the Methuselarity by Paul Hinek, following the idea of the longevity escape velocity by um, Aubrey de Grey. So there are many other ideas in this uh, sense also, like uh, actuarial escape velocity and uh, similar concepts. But the point is real. This is actually happening. Life expectancy keeps on increasing. And then soon, um, we will talk about that later, but soon in very few years, we will reach longevity escape velocity for different people, maybe in different conditions and different countries, but we are very, very close for longevity escape velocity and live long enough to live forever. So Terry, uh, now it's your turn and maybe you can translate uh, la muerte de la muerte quote. Thank you, Jose. <clears throat> uh, the, the quote, the, uh, the little blurb that I wrote for Jose's uh, wonderful book, uh, La Muerte de la Muerte, The Death of Death, uh, was translated as I was very anxious to live long enough to be able to experience a time that death got a taste of its own medicine. And I still uh, am looking forward to that day when it occurs. Um, when uh, Ray Kurzweil and I wrote our first book together, and it was uh, 18 years ago, it was published in 2004, it was the title was Fantastic Voyage. The subtitle was Live Long Enough to Live Forever. And the idea was, at least in 2004, the idea of being able to live much past uh, 120 was pretty much an impossible dream. So our idea, our idea was, let's see if we could do things 
in our lives, take steps that are needed to live long enough <clears throat> so that we would then be able to take advantage of new technologies that would be coming down the road that would allow us to live longer so that we could leapfrog into the technologies that would enable us to live for an indefinite period, i.e. forever. So uh, the way that Ray and I, Ray Kurzweil and I felt that this might uh, happen, one way of looking at it was uh, an analogy to three bridges. Uh, we felt that the concept was a bridge to a bridge to a bridge. And bridge one was essentially the technologies of what was then today. And what was then today in 2004 were things like lifestyle choices, what we chose to eat, how we chose to exercise, what type of sleep we got, what type of supplements we took, how we managed our cholesterol and blood pressure and things along those lines. <clears throat> so the best of what medicine had to offer at that time, both conventional medicine and complementary medicine. And that would enable us to live long enough to where we would be able to take advantage of bridge two technologies, which in 2004 were largely in the future. And these were biotechnological uh, innovations, things like genomic sequencing, things like uh, rege regenerative medicine, stem cell therapies, uh, and things along those lines. Well, here we are uh, 18 years later, and bridge two is no longer the future. We are now well along the lines of traveling over bridge two, and many of us have had access to genomic sequencing. We know our either full genome or exome uh, or partial genomics. Many of us have undergone regenerative uh, cell therapies. <clears throat> uh, so these things are really available today. And the hope is that they will enable us to live long enough to take advantage of bridge three, which we uh, conceived of as the nanotechnology revolution, <clears throat> where we would have things like nanobots, which were autonomous uh, devices that were on a nano scale, in other words, extremely tiny, smaller than our red and white blood cells and would circulate through our bloodstream. And they would be able to do things like create oxygen for us, like our normal red blood cells would. And if we had nanobots in our bloodstream and we happened to be unfortunate enough to have suffered a heart attack and our heart stopped, well, if we had someone to come along and just give us a injection of a few cc's of nanobots, uh, the type that could provide oxygen to us, well, it would give our brain and other vital organs long enough time to be resuscitated and kept alive by oxygen until the damage could be repaired. And similarly, we could have nanobiotic white blood cells that could be programmed externally to kill whatever viruses or uh, bacterial infections or parasitic infections uh, we might be infected with. So the idea was that we would do what's available today or what was then today to take advantage of bridge two, which is biotechnology, to then take advantage of nanotechnology. <clears throat> And we're getting closer and closer and the idea becoming that then, so the uh, Ray and I conceived that bridge two would be in full flower in the year 2023, which was a long way off when we wrote the book in 20, 2004, but it's actually next year now. So we're fully along the line of, of bridge two biotech and then bridge three nanotech uh, we thought would be in full flower in 2034. And Ray has always felt like it actually will occur sooner than that. And being the phenomenal futurist that he is, I think he's probably right. And it'll most likely occur closer to 2030. And these uh, nanobots may be a reality by that time. And what will happen is when these things are available, 
the main things that used to and still kill us, the causes of death, will no longer be able to kill us. So we will look forward to, in the very near future, reaching the singularity. The singularity being the point in time where the rate of technological change will be so fast that it's difficult, in fact, it's impossible to conceive of what will exist on the other side of that. So we're speeding headlong towards a singularity with the help of the three bridges and with help of all of the scientists and thinkers and individuals that are contributing to this to this movement. And, and it's, it's just going faster and faster all the time. So it's truly, I think, the, the most amazing time to have ever been alive in history. And it promises to become even more amazing in the years ahead. Wonderful. Thank you very much to Terry. And thank you also to Simon and Jose for your introductory remarks. Indeed, the prospect of reaching longevity, escape velocity in our lifetimes is one that should inspire and motivate every one of us, particularly because it is attainable and it is attainable to the extent that it's worthwhile for all of us to try and devote our efforts toward it. Terry has outlined the three bridges, the first being lifestyle, the second being biotechnology, and the third being nanotechnology. So now I would like to go to David Wood, who is the co-author of La Muerte de la Muerte. David, uh, based on the remarks that have been made thus far, what are your thoughts? What are your impressions regarding the prospects for reaching longevity escape velocity for the individuals listening to this discussion today and what can be done? What might be some of the uh, uncertainties involved and how can we overcome those uncertainties to benefit from each of the three bridges? Well, I'd like to build on what I've heard in these opening remarks. I'd like to set out briefly five reasons for optimism that we can indeed achieve longevity escape velocity by, say, 2040 or possibly sooner. And there are grounds for being optimistic, despite many people feeling in its uh, terrible time in the world because of the slight decline in life expectancy in some countries because of COVID and because of the threats of wars and economic decline. But nevertheless, there are good reasons to be optimistic. First, if we take the long-term view, the community of people who are bold enough to say they are working on curing aging, that's growing. If we go back to the 1980s, there were very few people who were bold enough to say that they thought it was possible to make a difference to the lifespan of organisms. Just a handful of people, maybe in the 1980s, but a few of them made interesting discoveries and made people realize perhaps there's something in this after all. And still the prevailing view then in the 1990s and even the 2000s from most professors to their students says, don't get involved in this. This isn't going anywhere. But basically every decade, the community seems to have roughly multiplied in size tenfold. So there are more and more people who are applying their brain power their skills, their resources to this field. That's the first reason for optimism. The second reason for optimism is that many of the world's most powerful, successful, dynamic companies or their leaders are targeting this field with their very considerable resources. Now, I know some people are dissatisfied at the progress that has been made by Google's flagship company Calico in the aging field and they wonder why hasn't the progress been faster? from Calico? Well, I have to say from my own experience in the technology field that many of these breakthrough innovations go through a long period of, I'm trying to sketch an exponential curve here, they go through a long period of disappointment, disappointment, disappointment before there is that breakthrough. So I still have hopes from Calico. I think what they're doing with naked mole rats, amongst other things, is fascinating. The way that they have got naked mole rats who are now nearly 40 years old much longer than could be expected, and they are understanding the genetics there. But the high-tech industry has also learned, possibly, from what's taken Calico some time, and many of the same people are now forming around a new organization, 
sponsored by some of the richest people in the world, Altos Labs. And it is very concrete in what they're doing. I have high hopes there. So the second reason for optimism is large, powerful tech companies, not just, by the way, in the West, but if you look at the statements made by some of the leading technology companies from China, they are also interested in getting into the health field. Now, the third reason for being confident is that there is a philosophical change that is underway, which regards aging as an accumulation of damage, which is characterized by a number of hallmarks. And to start off with, this is a strange idea. It went very much against the mainstream, but it's similar to what happened with our approach. I say our approach to humanity's approach to infectious diseases. If we go back to the 19th century, people didn't understand that most infectious diseases were caused in various ways by poor hygiene, a lack of understanding of the actions of bacteria and viruses. But when people started focusing on hygiene and vaccinations and inoculations, these terrible scourges, which had killed vast proportions of the human population throughout history, were tackled by that change in perspective. And that change in perspective for chronic diseases is accelerating too. And it's not just that people will now say they're working on curing aging in larger numbers than ever before. It's that they are forming around this uh, perception that there are hallmarks of aging which can be tackled. And what's really interesting is the growing discussions that some of the nine or 10 hallmarks may be more fundamental than others. And we're still not sure which, but there's a good chance that we will discover these hallmarks actually have connections. And if we can find the right therapies to target one or more of them, suddenly many of the others will come to be uh, under our control. The fourth reason for optimism is what Terry was saying. There are new tools coming our way, tools that weren't available in the past. And again, I'll wind back to the treatments of infectious diseases in the 1880s onwards. People like Robert Koch, the German scientists, were only able to discover the bacillus that was responsible for tuberculosis. And he was able to convince people it wasn't something genetic, it was something actually that could be spread by unclean habits. And as a result of that, gentlemen started shaving their beards and ladies started uh, showing more of their ankles on their dresses rather than letting their dresses drag along the ground and bring in germs. Uh, he was only able to discover the bacillus because of the progress of the second industrial revolution, the developments of things like better microscopes, better techniques for manipulating chemicals and uh, early uh, drugs. And progress made against infectious diseases was accelerated by more of the second industrial revolution. Well, we are now living through the early days of the fourth industrial revolution, NBIC, nanotech, biotech, infotech, and cognotech. And the strong likelihood is that they are progressing in leaps and bounds. Yes, we could discuss later why nanotech has been slower than many of us had hoped, slower than Eric Drexler had hoped. But I think once we have sufficient AI improvements, and that's something that has not slowed down at all. AI has exceeded many people's expectations. We will be able to use AI to improve the design of nanotech, and that will give us more ability to apply the insight that we can fix aging and diseases by tackling damage. And the fifth reason for optimism, and here I'm going in a bit more speculation, is I do think the general public are changing their tune on this. For most of history, many people secretly hoped that they could live forever, but what they would tell each other is, no, 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 I'm not interested in living forever. That would be selfish, that would be immature. But more and more people are actually starting to think, actually, aging is the cause of diseases. What makes most people die from COVID? It's the fact that they're already pretty old. And if we really want to stop people dying from COVID, then we should address the aging. Economists are getting into the act too. Act, economists are saying that these diseases are very expensive for the economy. And if we could only delay the onset of these diseases, maybe by as little as seven years or even as little as one year, it would have an impact in the hundreds of millions or even trillions of dollars. So economists are talking about the longevity dividend. It's raising some interest. And eventually, you know what? 
even politicians are going to pay attention because politicians will pay attention when enough of the public says, let's do this, not just for a humanitarian reason, but for an economic reason. You know, if we don't stop spending lots of money on people who are ill, if we can instead spend less money more wisely in preventing it by addressing aging, that's going to flip around the public perception and more of them public will say, yes, of course we should do this. It is obscene that we are not putting more of our collective resources on that. So I foresee a big change in public opinion in the next five to 10 years, which will accelerate our progress towards longevity escape velocity. So there are reasons for optimism. There are, of course, reasons to be worried too, but I think there's nothing facing us that cannot be solved by the five factors I've already identified. Yes, thank you, David. And uh, I will ask a question that Pam Keefe has posed to Dr. Terry Grossman. Uh, she's wondering on the nanotechnology bridge, do we know of any nanotech companies working on the development of nanorobots now, uh, or is this still a prospect that is a few years into the future? Terry, I believe you need to unmute. I don't have the name of the companies per se. There are several that are working on the development. But at this stage, it's mostly schematic diagrams and figuring out the logistics of the machinery that would be able to design <clears throat> these nanobots, uh, synthetic nanobots, because they're on such a small scale that we currently don't have the technology to create them. But sometime after uh, Ray and I came up with the concept of bridge two and bridge three, I realized that we actually have nanobots available today. <clears throat> they're not synthetic nanobots, but they're biological nanobots. And they go by the name of stem cells. The stem cells that all of us have in our bodies are designed to seek out and repair damage wherever it occurs. So uh, we actually already have uh, nanobots circulating in our bloodstream now, and a lot of scientists are finding it's more feasible today to program our stem cells to do more work uh, than they are doing uh, or to have them work in a different way. So before we get to the wholly synthetic nanobots, we're going to be working with the, and we are already working with the biological nanobots, the stem cells. <clears throat> so I had a, so I have a small question, and um, so what? Uh, so like, uh, I see the bridges to health. The most important part of my pyramid is what you eat or don't eat. Then followed by exercise, good sleep, and then followed by some social habits such as meditation, friendships, and those kinds of uh, things. So, um, at, at growth, and what's vastly important as well to also get attention to this field is that in 2004, when Fantastic Voyage was written, uh, there were uh, to, to measure aging, to really start measuring what, what's going on, epigenetics and, and um, e health, and all kinds of sensors, and blood age, and, and uh, anti aging, photogra uh, aging photographs with AI. All of those are not available. They're available now. So can you maybe talk about the tools that you use at Grossman Wellness Center to measure aging and what kind of things uh, like stem cells or other things are, are you doing to um, address the aging process? And then maybe uh, Jose Cordero can talk about the bridge to the anti-aging gene therapy mixtures that will be coming pretty soon and that are already being tested in mice like the FGF21 uh, adenovirus vector gene therapy or alpha cloto gene therapies which I find very exciting. Uh, thank you Simon. Uh, with respect to your first question uh, regarding how we currently measure <clears throat> biological age as opposed to chronological age um, back in 2002, 2004, I was using uh, a machine, I'm still using it, I have it in my clinic, uh, called the H-Scan. It came out of Germany, 
and it measured things like <clears throat> uh, near vision, which changes as you get older, hearing, high frequency hearing, which changes as you get older. I, or, or let me say, which changes as you age, because I think it's important that we make a distinction between getting older, which we're all doing, and aging, which we're not necessarily doing. Aging being defined as a harmful process. So uh, we have this uh, age scan machine that we measure biological age, but it's kind of a clunky tool. It's not very exact. <clears throat> the one that I like the best today is the true age diagnostic test, <clears throat> which measures three sets, uh, two sets of epigenetic uh, markers, uh, epigenetic, epigenetics being how the body expresses certain genes. And they've identified a number of genes that promote youthfulness and a number of genes that promote aging. And through uh, the Illumina sequencer, genomic sequencer, they're able to measure which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. And this generates uh, an epigenetic age. So I think this is a good way that we can measure how well we're doing with the choices we're making in our life, uh, how well we're how well we're undergoing this aging process with the goal that we actually, we can't change our chronological age, but we can change our biological age. We can get younger from that point of view. So uh, in addition to the genes being turned on and off, they also look at the immune system, the CD4 and CD8 cells, the cells that are involved in uh, killing bad, uh, bad things that come in our body, be they viruses or cancer cells. Uh, you need to have a, a fine-tuned relationship between our CD4 and CD8 uh, T lymphocytes. And this measures them. And it also gives us uh, another biological age. And the third thing that they've recently added to their profile is they're measuring telomere length. So by doing the true age diagnostic test, uh, we're doing that on patients now, we're able to get an idea of how well people are doing in terms of their epigenetics, the genes they're turning on and off, their immune system with their CD4 and CD8 T lymphocytes, and their telomere length. And then we can check it again, perhaps in a year or two years. You don't want to do it too often because it, it takes a amount of time, a certain amount of time for these changes to be able to, to register on the testing. In answer to your second question about the regenerative therapies that are available, most regenerative therapies that are done today are localized. So someone through wear and tear or injury has developed severe arthritis of their ankle or their knee or their hip or their back, can now undergo regenerative therapies one of the regenerative therapies being uh, PRP, platelet-rich plasma, where you simply take some blood, uh, concentrate the platelets, activate them, and then inject them into that area of the body. And they serve kind of as magnets to stem cells. So the body's own stem cells will come into that area and help it to heal. And this is, uh, you know, 10 to 20% the price of the full stem cell type therapies that are available. So this is a, a good, good thing to try. Um, it can't really be done as a systemic treatment, i.e. be given intravenously and travel throughout the body. Uh, the regenerative therapies that are used right now, it seems though the, the main and most popular ones are exosomes. And exosomes are tiny vesicles or fluid filled sacs that are found within stem cells. And they're typically taken from either cord blood, umbilical cord blood, or from placental tissue uh, or amniotic fluid. And they have the advantage of uh, working very well to stimulate the body's own mechanisms for healing itself or regeneration. And most of these are also done locally. They're injected into a joint, they're injected into uh, a back or whatever. Uh, a few clinics are doing them systemically, uh, giving them intravenously, but 
it's almost a, a bit cost prohibitive to get enough of these type of regenerative factors to give intravenously to circulate through the body and have a major effect. So uh, that's kind of the state of the art today for regenerative therapies. Uh, thank you so much for the insight. And maybe, uh, maybe very well esteemed Dr. Cordero can talk about the anti-aging gene vaccine, or what you, um, or uh, what you were talking about, the la muerte, de la muerte, the, the bridge to that you guys are seeing. Uh, yes, and let me also say thank you once again to Terry because I was inspired very much on what he has written. Uh, obviously, fantastic voyage, live long enough to live forever. And then his second book, also with uh, our common friend, Ray Kurzweil, Transcend. And each one of the letters of Transcend is something that you have to do. So it really is a fantastic book. I recommend that all of you read those books. Now, let me give you my own version of The Three Bridges. Uh, because I think it, it is a fantastic um, way to think about it. The first bridge that takes you into the second bridge that takes you into the third bridge. So the first bridge, uh, obviously the 2010s uh, or even before the beginning of the century and the millennium to do what your mother told you to do. Eat well, behave well, sleep, do exercise, maybe some meditation. That is bridge one. Uh, bridge two, beginning now, uh, which is the first biotechnology treatments. And then bridge three, which are the first uh, nanotechnology treatments in the next decade, in the 2030s. Uh, sometimes also I have seen uh, Ray Kurzweil now talk about a possible bridge four, including artificial intelligence, because the date that he uses is 2045, so, Terry, maybe you want to comment on that too, uh, 2045, which is a fantastic time, both for the singularity and for immortality with rejuvenation technologies. And Ray talks a lot about uh, artificial intelligence in this new kind of final bridge between bridge three and immortality. In fact, um, I had the pleasure to review the manuscript of Ray's uh, coming book, The Singularity is Near Air, uh, near air, okay, because it is near air, it is closer, uh, but he keeps those two dates, which I think is very important. He always has kept these two dates for uh, 30, maybe 40 years. Uh, the first date is 2029, 2030, and the second date is 2045. And then he basically says that by 2029, 2030, we will pass the Alan Turing test, and also we will reach longevity escape velocity or the methuselarity as some people have called it too so the first uh, target 2030 uh, alan turing test and longevity escape velocity or methuselarity the second date uh, that he ratifies in his new book the singularity is nearer it is 2045 for reaching the singularity which is this global artificial intelligence that will reach human intelligence level for all humans in the planet and also rejuvenation technologies for everybody. So basically immortality. So that's my review of the three bridges idea, which is fantastic. And I always use it to explain these ideas about uh, the death of death, because it is one bridge into another bridge to another bridge. Uh, that means there is no silver bullet. There is not just one single silver bullet, but there are many things we need to do. As my co-author, David, mentioned, uh, there are several hallmarks of aging. Some are more important than others, but we don't know yet. But I have very good news also, uh, because David Wood, he, he studied mathematics at Cambridge, and he studied science also at Cambridge. I also studied at Cambridge but Cambridge, Massachusetts. I studied at MIT. I am an engineer, actually, from MIT. And uh, uh, mathematicians, scientists, and um, engineers, we look at the aging problem in a different way. Uh, because you, Terry, you are a fantastic, fantastic medical doctor. And um, um, also, let me some more promotion for you. You gave 
probably one of the best uh, talks at Rad First, Revolution Against Aging and Death. And you talked about the incredible advances we are going to see uh, to control and cure cancer, uh, to control and cure um, heart trouble, and also uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So that was fantastic. I still remember, maybe you can later give us a brief update of how we are going to cure, control, and reverse uh, cancer, heart disease, and neurodegenerative diseases. So everybody has to go to RADFEST, Revolution Against Aging and Death, which this year will be in October 6 to 9. But let me come back to medical doctors, because Terry, you are a medical doctor, and Simon, you also studied medicine. So medical doctors uh, are different from engineers and mathematicians or uh, other types of scientists. And uh, especially, let me tell you my point of view as an engineer. Uh, if I see that something, something works, I just want to understand it, maybe replicate it and do it better. And I always have to say this because immortality already exists. The proof that immortality is possible is that it already exists in nature. Cancer cells discover how not to age, and they are called biologically immortal because they do not age. So the proof that immortality is possible is cancer cells, for example. And cancer cells did not go to Cambridge University or didn't go to MIT. Cancer cells didn't go to any university. And they discovered how to stop aging. And also, they did not spend millions of dollars, billions of dollars. No, they did it for free, basically, almost for free. So uh, once we understand what cancer has done without going to university and without paying millions or billions of dollars, we will replicate it and we will do it better, cheaper and faster for all humans. So this is a very important and powerful idea. Immortality already exists and we just need to understand how cancer cells uh, did it and became immortal biologically, or how other cells are biologically immortal, like germ cells. Germ cells are also called biologically immortal. And some organisms, like hydras, and the immortal jellyfish, because they are also immortal, they are called biologically immortal. And there are some other organisms that uh, do not have senescence. They don't have apparent senescence. That means they don't seem to age. Uh, so uh, many organisms actually can live uh, longer, longer than humans. Also, uh, there are species of animals that live longer than humans. There are some sharks, sharks that might have lived for 500 years. And uh, even though a mouse might only live two years or three years, uh, we have sharks that live 300 years. 500 years and more. So aging and longevity seems to be very flexible. So uh, this is what engineers want to do. We want to understand how nature discovered immortality and then we can do it better. So let me go back to uh, treatments of bridge two, biotechnology. And also we invited another panelist today, Liz Parrish. Liz Parrish, that we called Patient Zero uh, for uh, um, some treatments, especially for some gene therapies. Uh, she couldn't come today because today is Mother's Day and she has two children and she has one mother. So she had several celebrations today. So we are missing Liz Parrish with us. But her company, BioViva, they are working on gene therapies. Uh, she has actually practiced on herself already for different gene therapies. Probably the most famous one is telomerase injections. She has injected herself with telomerase to make her telomeres grow longer, uh, which is actually what cancer does. Cancer cells continuously grow telomerase or equivalent to grow their telomeres. So their telomeres are long, and that is why cancer cells do not age. 
cancer cells do not age and they live indefinitely because they produce telomeras or the equivalent. So Liz Parrish used this therapy on herself, which was uh, incredible uh, six years ago. Uh, actually a bit longer in 2015 in Colombia because this is illegal in countries that are overregulated. And Liz Parrish is American. Her doctors were Americans. Some of the technology that she used is European, but this is not allowed in Europe and is not allowed in the USA. So we found a doctor in Colombia who did this procedure. So her first treatment for telomerase injection was done done in Bogota. Uh, so now BioViva, which is the company started by Liz Parrish, that you can also meet at Radfest, Revolution Against Aging and Death in San Diego, October 6 to 9, this fall in San Diego. All welcome. Talk to Liz Parrish, hopefully to incredible people like Terry Grossman and many, many others, both medical doctors and engineers, uh, mathematicians, scientists, and other different professions. So anyway, uh, talking about biotechnology, there are many treatments beginning. Terry Grossman spoke about exosomes as well, and stem cells. Stem cells is actually natural nanotechnology. Stem cells is the nanotechnology that just occurs in life already. So we also need to understand how stem cells work and this is what engineers will do we will discover how a stem cell work and we can do this nanotechnology in the biotechnology second bridge anyway those are some of the ideas the incredible things we are seeing bridge two biotech bridge three nanotech and the final bridge with artificial intelligence into immortality by 2045 if not earlier earlier Excellent. Uh, so Terry, I would like to hear your feedback on Jose's remarks, and then we can launch into more of our viewer questions. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we've, uh, a few of us have uh, mentioned this uh, idea promoted by Ray Kurzweil of a fourth bridge. And the fourth bridge is really the artificial intelligence bridge and we've leapfrogged a little bit it's actually going on much more than bridge three the nanotech uh bridge right now in terms of advances in ai are coming fast and furious and one of the examples is for instance when covid first erupted uh and was unleashed uh, upon the world, the drug companies wanted to develop uh, an mRNA vaccine against it. And they used artificial intelligence to find out what molecule they needed to basically provoke uh, an immune response against the spike protein that's the, the hallmark of COVID infections. They did that in three days. So the actual drug discovery for the vaccines that have now been given hundreds of millions of times were discovered in three days, but the vaccines weren't available for almost a year because they had to go through all of these phase one and phase two and phase three trials with uh, safety studies and the rest. Well, part of this bridge four is not only can we use artificial intelligence for drug discovery, we can use artificial intelligence for drug testing. So we don't need to wait for 10 months or 12 months for these drugs to be tested and found to be safe. We can create virtual models, virtual humans, in other words, and see how these either vaccines or medications are going to act. And that's going to bring the time frame between when the drug is discovered and when it can be approved and uh, available for people much, much more rapidly than it ever has been in the past. So I think that with kind of bridge four uh, 
intercalating itself between bridge two and bridge three, we're going to be going uh, faster and faster in many ways, not, not just merely with uh, drug discovery, but with almost anything we can think about uh, in the world of medicine um, as well. Yes. So before, before we go to the viewers' questions, I wanted to, because I think like many viewers will be thinking, so what can I do like right now uh, to, to slow down aging. Uh, one thing you can go to Grossman centers, they're gonna, Grossman Wellness Center, they're gonna treat you really well there and slow down your aging. But I also talked in the last uh, virtual enlightenment salon about augmented fasting, which I believe uh, to be uh, one of the most powerful uh, bridge one therapies there. So taking fasting, which is more powerful than caloric restriction, and we know that caloric restriction extends lifespan massively. Take fasting augmented with hormetics, with natural-based hormetic things that can um, that can uh, um, uh, slow uh, slow down the aging process massively. And uh, I talked about augmented fasting elaborately in our last. Uh, virtual uh, enlightenment salon. And I really see that as a really powerful bridge one to get us into bridge two. And the bridge two, which I'm most excited about is the um, FGF21 alpha clodo uh, gene therapy combinations with some supplement with some powerful supplements or third generation polyphenolic substances like polyphenols are um, they're not absorbed well in the body and they don't have that good pharmacokinetics. But um, the polyphenols that are being made, not synthetic, but, but they're being tinkered around with a, a little bit and the, and those kinds of things are, are very impressive. You also have um, very impressive new novel HDAC inhibitors, which we talked about as well in that virtual salon, which ketosis is an HDAC inhibition, uh, uh, inhibiting uh, drug actually, uh, endogenously. But uh, you got synthetic HDAC inhibitors coming. You got pan, uh, synthetic pan PPR receptor activators also coming. So there are many things coming in the biotech pipeline, and they're already reaching people in clinical trials. And so that's really exciting. And my bridge one is augmented fasting, and uh, to really get us into bridge two, which would be the biotech and the gene therapies that are actually really close, or I like like. Uh, Codero and and uh, Dr. Grossman said like like with the exosomes they're already available with the local stem cell therapies and and what Co uh, Cordero said with BioViva with the gene therapies they're um, they're all available already uh, already so um, we're already <laughs> we're we're doing really well we're doing really well in this regard. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Simon, and thank you to. Terry as well for these very informative remarks. I have linked here to our previous April 17th virtual enlightenment salon where we had Simon and Zach Richardson as our guests of honor and Simon delved into considerable depth on the subjects that he mentioned just now, including augmented fasting. And I also wanted to acknowledge Terry's comments about the use of artificial intelligence in drug discovery and the discovery of other treatments. COVID-19 vaccines were a remarkable achievement of contemporary science. I'm proud that I have been quadruple vaccinated uh, at this point with the Moderna vaccine. I believe that has greatly improved my own chances of survival in good health. I, I have avoided this dread disease, I think, for now, and I hope that that will continue. But I do think this is a good bridge into a comment that was made by our friend Didier Kernel, and we hope to have him as our guest on our next virtual enlightenment salon of May 15th to discuss this quite important subject, which is the recent decline in life expectancy that David Wood alluded to uh, for the past two years, 2020 and 2021. In his comment, Didier mentions that sadly, this was not a slight decline of life expectancy. It seemed to be more than one year of decrease in two years. 2020 had the first global decline in 70 years, and 2021 had the second 
uh, such consecutive decline. And I think we know what this decline resulted from, this dreadful pandemic uh, that is unfortunately still ongoing. But in light of this, I am curious about the panelists' remarks about how this affects the overall trajectory of life expectancy. Do you think this is just a downward blip and we will recover quickly, or will it be a longer road toward recovery? And furthermore, what can we as individuals do to make sure uh, we don't become uh, a statistic in terms of mortality that we can overcome this terrible time period that unfortunately our species is experiencing right now? So I think David wants to make a remark, but a really quick one here. I see it as a blip because what David remarked was as well that most COVID patients that die are um, either older of age or either have obesity, blood pressure problems, or some kind of mix of other chronic disease issues. And if you tackle aging, and that was Deep Longevity, another uh, highly innovative aging company that's been spin off from um, Alex's company that does the, um, the deep medicine with the AI that Terry Grossman was talking about, um, has shown that uh, their aging measurements uh, correlate with death rates from COVID. So COVID is most of the times not deadly in young, healthy people. And it's basically, if you can tackle aging, uh, you can also tackle COVID. So in aging, you tackle 90%, 95% of all chronic disease and all suffering with one with one stroke. And I think that's a very um, important remark. And then I'll, I'll give the floor to David Wood, who uh, indicated that he would like to. I think the simple answer here is that bridge one is not enough. We never expected to get to longevity philosophy, uh, velocity simply by applying more of today's methods. They've been remarkable, but they have slowed down their growth trajectory. Earlier, I tried to sketch an exponential curve, but that's too simple. When you study how technology grows in reality, it goes through one kind of S curve, and then I'm not going to be able to sit, draw, do this by my hands. And often uh, the first loses its power, and you can't go any further, and you need a jump to another uh, paradigm that's been studied in many fields in uh, technology. If you step back far enough, you don't see the jumps between the different uh, paradigms or the different platforms, and it looks like a continuous growth. But in reality, there are periods in which you need to find a better technology. And the methods which have got us to today's improvements in life expectancy are not sufficient to boost it that much further, which is why we it shouldn't be too uh, surprised to have a slowdown and even a decline. In fact, there are other reasons for the decline in life expectancy in some parts of the world. There are growth in deaths of despair. I also think, by the way, that COVID is more serious than just a killing uh, elderly people. And the elderly people are more effective. But many people who have COVID and survive have their life expectancy reduced because parts of their body are no longer as fit as they were before. So often diseases kill people, but not straight away. They kill them 10, 20, 30 years into the future. So I am concerned about COVID, but uh, I think it reinforces the fact that we need to get to these later trajectories. And there is ample evidence that these later trajectories, these later paradigms, uh, bridge two, bridge three, are coming. And in fact, I think some of them may come even sooner than my usually optimistic friend, uh, Jose Cordero, was suggesting. He said, we'll get to the singularity by 2045. Well, I think we may get to the singularity sooner than that because of the self-reinforcing uh, improvements that AI systems can uh, experience. We have AI systems called AutoML, automated machine learning, which are able to set up machine learning frameworks 
that can uh, produce better new machine learning frameworks than even humans can do. So if you read up on AutoML, you'll see the possibility for improvement. In practical terms, I point to what Google's DeepMind have done recently with AlphaFold, predicting the way in which uh, proteins will fold up in their three-dimensional structure, given the sequence of uh, amino acids from which they are formed. This was not expected to be solved so quickly, and uh, most people were taken by surprise at the progress of AlphaFold as it moved from its initial version to later versions. And as AI matures further, the likelihood is that companies such as Deep Longevity, which grew out of in Silica Medicine, will apply AI to get a lot faster progress with treatments for cancer and these other things. So we should not be concerned overly. Of course, it is a social disaster. Many people's lives are being set back, but we should keep our eye on the big picture and accelerate, do what we can to accelerate the adoption of AI and these other bridges. I would like to jump in there to continue because I believe also uh, this pandemic, which is very small in historical terms, very small, uh, has paralyzed. So imagine for this small pandemic, we have paralyzed the planet. Imagine what we should do for the biggest pandemic of all of them, which is aging. Aging is the major pandemic. And all of us are uh, suffering aging. Um, Anyway, to put this in historical context, the Spanish uh, flu, which was not a Spanish, by the way, it started in the USA, but it's called a Spanish flu, killed uh, over 50 million people. And the population of the planet was four times smaller. The population was about 2 billion people in the planet, and at least 50 million people died. And if we go back centuries into the past, the Black Plague killed one out of every three citizens in most of Europe. A third of the European population was killed during the bubonic plague. It happened actually several times. It was not just one, at least two major bubonic plagues in history, and not only in Europe, throughout the planet. So those were really big, big pandemics. So. So now that the World Health Organization is also trying to quantify how many people have died during 2020 and 2021, they discovered it, it was not just the 5 million people that was originally estimated. It could be 20 million people. But even those numbers, which are horrible, and the medical condition that um, can continue as David mentioned, because uh, if you have had COVID, you might have some side effects later on as well. But anyway, what I think it is important, if this small pandemic has paralyzed the planet, then we should truly paralyze the planet and put a lot more money against aging and death, because that is really killing all of us. But um, besides the bad news, and obviously life is new technologies. When these vaccines were developed, people said, oh, it would take 10 years, 10 years to develop the vaccine. Well, the vaccine actually, well, first of all, the virus was sequenced in two weeks in China. The virus was sequenced and then it was sent via email to Europe and North America and Moderna and BioNTech, Pfizer, developed the first uh, vaccines in two days. Imagine the sequence of the virus two weeks after it was identified, and then the first vaccines in two days. And even the human clinical trials that take years, they were done in a few months. So this is an incredible advancement in science. And it is so incredible that now this new technology messenger RNA is being used to cure three totally unrelated medical conditions. One which is um, HIV. HIV is a virus, like COVID, it is a virus, but also for cancer. And to develop mRNA vaccines against cancer is really fascinating because cancer is your own cells 
that mutate and stop aging. So it is an attack against the mutant cells of our body that become cancerous. And the other uh, therapy will be for malaria, which is a parasite. So it is incredible. This new technology, messenger RNA, is used for your own mutant cells, cancer, for another virus like HIV, AIDS, and also for a parasite like malaria. This is an incredible advancement. Uh, and it was so fast, as Terry was saying, it really is incredibly exponential what is happening. And this will continue. That is also why uh, Ray Kurzweil, he says that he will reach at least his own personal longevity escape velocity by 2000. 30. And now I have that question for Terry, because you are a doctor and you see him also as a medical doctor, uh, because Ray Kurzweil right now, he's 74, 74. And he says he will reach his own longevity escape velocity by 2030. So Terry, uh, tell me about that, because I like that optimism. <laughs> well, uh, Ray is a very optimistic person. Uh, but I do second uh, his idea. So he's uh, 74 now. So in eight years, he would be 82. <clears throat> and, you know, the things that that he does, uh, I don't want to go too much into depth, <clears throat> but we all know that he's very aggressive with supplementation <clears throat> and things like that. And he's working very hard to keep himself healthy. And I see no reason that he would not be able to reach his own personal goal of escape velocity occurring in 2030 based on the trajectory that he's on right now. I wanted to like, if I could make a couple comments on the decrease in uh, life expectancy for humankind as a whole that has gone in the reverse direction in uh, 2020 and 2021. Interestingly, the, the few months, it was the first time probably in any of our lifetimes, uh, 2020 was the first year that longevity decreased, human life expectancy decreased a few months, but they felt that this was largely due to the worldwide obesity epidemic. And obesity is so tragic in, it, it increases an individual's uh, risks of everything, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, uh, there's no disease that is assisted by obesity. So interestingly, like when Simon was speaking earlier, one of the best ways that we can uh, deal with uh, obesity is by, you know, fasting. And I think that for everyone is practical advice, they should engage in time restricted eating intermittent fasting of 14 hours or more every day. So if you finish eating supper at 6 or 7 p.m., then you wouldn't consume any calories at all until 8 or 9 a.m. the next day. Uh, by doing so, you begin the process of, number one, lowering your insulin levels, which is associated with increases in longevity, and decrease in degeneration and disease. So we should do that every day. And then in addition, maybe one day every week or 10 days or so, going for a 24 hour water fast. And by doing that, uh, we will force some of the senescent cells in our body, the cells that we wanna die that don't die to engage in apoptosis or programmed cell death. So I think by combining uh, daily fasts of 14 hours, weekly or so fasts of 24 hours. And then finally, I think that everybody should give serious consideration to taking metformin, which mimics caloric restriction. Uh, when they studied the uh, longevity genes that are expressed by uh, caloric restriction, more longevity genes are expressed by taking metformin. So Right now, metformin is undergoing uh, NIH sponsored, there's a $77 million trial called the TAME trial, trial to assess metformin and aging. 
and NIH for the first time ever and the National Institute of Aging are willing to take consideration of aging as a disease that might be amenable to a, a therapy. So I think we have things available to us today that we can start to turn around this, uh, this degradation in our life expectancy in 2020 it was due to obesity. And in 2021, it was fully a year that was largely due to the number of human years lost uh, as a result of COVID. But I think that we are in the process of turning that around as well. Yes, thank you very much, Terry. This is extremely helpful for our understanding of the causes of the recent decline in life expectancy, as well as what individuals could do for themselves. And John H. remarks in our chat that he is, quote, only 68, but he likes the optimistic assessment of Ray Kurzweil. And indeed, one of the purposes of our conversation today is to communicate to people that no matter how old you are, you have a fighting chance and you should do what it takes to try to reach longevity escape velocity. I also wanted to share this link to the interview that I conducted with Ray Kurzweil on stage at RadFest 2018. That was the time I got to meet him in person and ask him some questions, including some health related questions like how he was able to cure his own type two diabetes, which he got at the age of 35. And this is, I think, a good bridge to the comment you made about metformin, Terry, because I am going to turn 35 in just a little more than two months. I am a runner. I run about 40 to 60 miles per week. One of the uh, observations that I have read about metformin is it essentially mimics the effects of exercise on uh, blood sugar levels. And I'm curious about two things. First of all, if one engages in that amount of exercise, does that perform a similar function to taking metformin or could there still be an added benefit to taking metformin? And the other question is, what is the age at which taking metformin would typically bring about uh, greater health benefits? Because I understand the studies performed on the health benefits of metformin generally start with people 50 or older. Is there any benefit for younger people in taking it? And I believe you need to unmute. In answer to your first question, uh, is running good enough? Uh, do you need to take metformin or should you consider taking metformin in addition to running? Uh, and I would say yes, I think they work synergistically. But one of the things that uh, we've discovered is that metformin itself blunts some of the beneficial effects of running. So what I suggest that people do is they take metformin at bedtime and it's available in, this, in an extended release formulation. So if you take it at bedtime, even though it has a, a long half-life, most of that will be, uh, majority will be gone by the time you're doing your exercise during the day. So I think that's a, a good plan of how to proceed. Um, so the other question is at what age one should consider taking metformin? And I like to look at basically our genetic code, which was written in the Stone Age, 50, 100,000 years ago or more. And the aging process really doesn't begin to pick up speed. The, the knee of the curve that has been referenced earlier, where we have things changing dramatically at this knee, the knee of the aging curve begins at, I hate to say it, age 35. Uh, before an individual is 35 years of age, unless they're making some very poor lifestyle choices, they're almost guaranteed good health. 
because the programming that was uh, written into our DNA uh, tens of thousands of years ago for the survival of the species needed to ensure that we stayed alive long enough, A, to reproduce, which typically occurred between 15 and 20, and B, stayed alive long enough to take care of the next generation until they were able to take care of themselves, which is another 15 to 20 years. So it, it turns out that most people are guaranteed good health until 35, and then the aging process kicks in. I'm going to go off topic just a little bit. Uh, there is uh, there is an enzyme in the body called mTOR, the mammalian target of rapamycin. And mTOR is a double-edged sword. It is, it is something that has been in our bodies for millions and millions of years. It's been conserved for a long time. And what this mTOR does is it's very good for helping children and adolescents and young adults to grow and mature and stay healthy. And then around 30 or 35 years of age, it changes hats and is designed to ruin our health, basically destroy our health. And in the primitive times, very few people were able to live past 35 years of age. So it ensured that the, sc the scarce number of calories that were available were spent on people who were going to propagate the species and not these elders over 35 years of age. So I personally regard 35 as the age at which people start to quote age. So at, at that age, I think it would be appropriate to consider doing something like metformin. Prior to that, I don't think we really need to do much other than, you know, the appropriate lifestyle choices associated with uh, good health. Yes. I wanted to make I want to make a really small remark on what uh, uh, Dr. Grossman said, and uh, we had that in our last talk as well. With you have the mTOR, which stimulates the anabolic pathways, and you have the AMPK energy sensor, which stimulates all of the catabolic pathways, which is the autophagy and, uh, and those kinds of things. And by combining uh, metformin with leucine, which reduces the NK saturation value of sirtuin 1 by 50%, and with alpha-lipoic acid, which is also an AMPK activator. Uh, and by taking those three, you um, you really get a, a AMPK activated, which reduces, in turn, mTOR activation as well. So uh, really, those those three supplements are, are, very, uh, are very handy uh, in, uh, in uh, activating AMPK and reducing mTOR uh, and inhibiting mTOR. I absolutely agree with you that there is a considerable amount of synergy among those uh, three elements in terms of both uh, toning down mTOR and upregulating AMPK. Yes, thank you very much to Terry and to Simon as well. And in our YouTube chat, Jason Geringer says, welcome to the club, Janati. Well, not for another couple of months, uh, but uh, I, I am well aware of what is coming. And indeed, this is oh, when no, the, the battle. <laughs> <laughs> this is when the real battle against aging begins. But fortunately, I have a lot of great examples within the longevity community to refer to one of them is my friend dr bill andrews who is 70 right now and he still runs in ultra races i was at a race just on april 23rd where he was also one of the competitors and he ran a longer distance than i did he ran the 30 kilometers on a quite windy elevated trails with a lot of climbing. Uh, I ran about 24 kilometers, so a shorter distance option for that race. But anyway, he's a great role model as well to emulate and consult. And we had a virtual enlightenment salon with him. Now I would like to turn the floor over to David Shoemaker, who had a number of questions that he wanted to ask. So uh, David, I will let you raise those questions any of them that you would like to emphasize or just ask all of them if you think that would be uh, efficacious 
Yeah, thanks, Janati. Uh, fascinating conversation. And of course, it does bring up uh, ideas, things to talk about. Early in the conversation, we led with the idea of longevity escape velocity, and we heard 20, 30 other years. There was, I think, a brief mention to the fact that there may be, it won't be uniform as it comes in. So I was wondering if any of the panelists would be willing to speak to what demographic groups or what medical conditions or whatever else the variables may be that might be on that leading edge of longevity escape velocity. That's question one. Well, I'll be happy to feel that. Um, so this idea of rather than just one knee, it's, it's more like a series of S's. So you have one knee of the curve and then you kind of reach a plateau and then there's another knee of the curve, you reach another plateau, et cetera. So each of those knees occurs with some sort of technological breakthrough. So the one of the uh, comments uh, that was made earlier about a uh, talk I gave at Radfest a few years ago concerned, um, I talked about early diagnosis of the two leading killers which are heart disease and cancer. Together, mm. heart disease, stroke, and cancer kill 55% of us. So if we had a way to basically make them go away or reduce the risk of those killers, that would be a significant knee in the curve that would increase our longevity significantly. And the good news is when I gave that lecture, whatever it was four or five years ago, I talked about there was a, a certain uh, blood test for uh, measuring certain uh, proteins in the blood that are given off by cancer cells, which is no longer offered because it turned out that it wasn't the greatest test. But the good news is there is now uh, a test called the GRAIL test that is being adopted by many oncologists. It's receiving mainstream, ex mainstream acceptance. So we have an even better test for early detection of cancer. If you're able to detect a tumor when it's the size of a pinhead, it's very, very easy to treat. You know, more than 99% likelihood of cure. Whereas if it's reached the size of a, a marble, survival is much, much less. So we're closing in on the ultimately early detection of cancer which is going to be a significant spike and me, and then we're going to get to another plateau. And I think we're going to do the same thing with heart disease. When I gave that lecture, I talked about doing coronary <clears throat> artery calcium tests, which five years ago was what I felt was the best way we could see if we had any plaque in our arteries that would uh, be uh, worrisome for us. Well, I don't do that coronary artery calcium test anymore because it's been replaced by an ultrasound test of the carotid arteries in the neck. And the ultrasound test has many advantages over the coronary artery calcium test. Number one, it doesn't require radiation. It uses ultrasound, so it's safe. Number two, it detects soft plaque, which is the type of plaque that's apt to rupture and cause a heart attack or stroke. Whereas the calcified plaque, which the coronary artery calcium test would detect. It was a kind of an indirect measurement that if you had calcified plaque, well, yeah, probably have soft plaque. Well, it turned out that over, I think it's 49% of people who had coronary artery calcium tests had soft plaque when they did the carotid IMTs. So it's a much more sensitive test. So if we were to do, and then another reason that it's a great test is it's cheap. It's uh, in the neighborhood of $150. So if we were to start doing carotid IMT, intima media thickness testing, on basically men when they reach 50, women when they, they, um, men when they reach 45, and women when they reach 50, I think that the likelihood of anyone dying of a heart attack would drop drastically, that we would have essentially the ability to diagnose it early enough it would be like the cancer cells that are the size of a pinhead. We would find plaque at an early, early stage and be able to reverse it because it's easy. And notice I use the word reverse. It is now possible 
to take the cholesterol, those gruel-like deposits of plaque inside of our arteries and by proper lifestyle, nutrient, supplement, and medication to reverse it and make it go away completely. I've had patients who have soft plaque, one year is half, two years it's gone. So these, these major killers are going to go away and there'll be two big jumps in longevity that occur as a result of them. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a, a good answer. I was curious if, um, see how I want to say this. I was curious if those two would be great and it would help extend life on average over years, but talking about longevity escape velocity, uh, Jose, maybe you have an idea of who might be able to benefit that the most. I'm thinking of maybe in light of like uh, the SENS Foundation and the things that they talk about as far as repair, are some of those repairs maybe sooner on the horizon than others, or am I missing something here? Um, well, David, uh, good that you are bringing back uh, the idea of longevity escape velocity, uh, because I, I think it is fantastic that we might be so close as by the year 2029, 20, 2030, as even Ray Kurzweil says, and I repeat, he's 74, and so Terry, he reminded us that he could be 82, eight years older by that time. So I will pass the ball, the question to Terry. Um, do you think we can reach longevity escape velocity everywhere for everybody by 2030? Or there will be differences between countries, between groups, uh, between people, um, between different ages, of course. What do you think about 2030 for longevity escape velocity, Terry? Well, Jose, I think that um, <clears throat> it's like most technological breakthroughs, be it, you know, cell phones, computers, flat screen TVs, they start out being very expensive. They start out being not widely available, but the price point and the availability uh, changes very, very rapidly, exponentially. And I think the same thing will apply to access to longevity escape velocity. I think that I don't believe that it's going to be fully a hundred percent available to anybody as early as 2030, but I think it'll be much more available than it is today. It's very hard to predict because the rate at which technological change, medical innovation is occurring, it's very, very difficult to keep up with. I mean, it's literally, you know, warp speed. So, Maybe it will be fully available to some individuals by 2030. Will it be widely available at that point? I think, I think not. I think it's going to take a few years to percolate through both the United States and worldwide. Um, I, I, also, I also have a small remark uh, uh, about this topic. So, of course, the more extensive therapies will take time for that exponential technology. You see the exponential drop in price, and then it will become available to anyone. Just like Terry said, everything starts expensive, and it is and it is the rich people who buy those products, who fund the innovation, so that it gets cheaper, and eventually we'll all get it. However, there are very uh, cheap interventions that are uh, that can become available right now, such as um, most are um, familiar with the cardiovascular poly pill but there's also formulations called the anti-aging poly pill with low doses of metformin low doses of rapamycin a little bit of aspirin and then some other formulations out there those are all very cheap drugs and we've seen in the various of the um, National Institute of Aging's uh, gold standard, my studies, that the rapamycin metformin combination enhances lifespan by 22% at, at certain dosages. So we, we, we have seen that, and rapamycin and metformin are dirt cheap. You just have to watch out with the dosages, of course. If you dose rapamycin too high, you get immune suppression, if I'm not mistaken. So you have to watch out a bit. But like an anti-aging poly pill, and I would 
uh, in my view, I would think about things as well, like N, N acetylcysteine, vitamin D, glycine. So there was a, N a glycine and acetylcysteine paper which increased lifespan, uh, lifespan, average lifespan, median lifespan by 20%, but also increased the maximum lifespan by 20%. And then combining it also with things like vitamin D and melatonin and creating a really cheap anti-aging poly pill and there are already scientists working on poly pill formulations with these drugs which are dirt cheap and which have been shown in mice to extend lifespan by 22 percent so those could be readily available to to many countries and many of the poorer individuals of our society yes uh thank you simon and now i want to give zach richardson the opportunity to ask some questions. I know he has a number of questions for our guests as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I was uh, reading through Transcend earlier today. I guess I had, um, there, there was something in the first chapter that caught my mind. Uh, transhumanists often have sort of a bad reputation as being um, these heartless machine individuals that are going to merge with robots and be emotionless, logical uh, creatures. But you had written in the first chapter of Transcend uh, about spindle cells, which um, connect all around through the brain rather than just like the densely packed uh, neurons in the prefrontal cortex. Now these, these spindle cells, um, Simon has me doing some, something called dual end back training, which is supposed to increase your working memory. And that makes me think that would help like that sort of logical processing uh, of thought. These spindle cells, are there any practices we can do that, or, or reasons that the practices we're talking about now would increase the, the density or uh, spread of these spindle cells and allow us to have greater emotional uh, responses and more emotional connections to topics than an uh, unaugmented individual? I don't know if they would specifically increase spindle cell density, but I do know of two interventions that have very salubrious or beneficial effects on brain aging. And they're also not even remotely soulless. I think that they would enhance our ability to connect to other people and to be more human as transhumans, more human transhumans. And number one, is learning a new language. When you learn a new language, you involve all different aspects of your brain and it's very good. So that's something that doesn't cost any money and just learn a new language and you will increase uh, neuronal density uh, considerably and reduce brain aging that you can measure with any of the number of tests that we can use uh, like the P300, et cetera. The second one is even more interesting and it's ballroom dancing. Because when you go to ballroom dancing classes, you're learning to integrate uh, a number of musculoskeletal things along with rhythm, along with music, uh, along with memorization. So uh, those two interventions, I think, will make us better people, more human people, and also keep our brains uh, younger as we, as we move, move along. And a small, a small remark about uh, brain aging and how how that plays along with uh, with everything. So there are many. So fasting uh, increases prefrontal cortex and hippocampal densities, and the prefrontal cortex is where all your emotional regulation uh, uh, takes place. So that you will be um, you will become a more empathic, a more lovable, a more kind and more sincere person through many uh, fasting cycles, especially the longer fast and uh, uh, a less extreme intervention. We saw this in the Vitacog study was just high amounts of fish oil with B vitamins. When you combine those two, they slow down brain atrophy rates by 40% in human. So, um, so yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Simon and thank you to Terry. Some quite interesting practical suggestions with 
very low barriers to entry. Anyone can learn a new language. Anyone can try to pick up ballroom dancing. Anyone can try fasting. Uh, so uh, I am quite appreciative of this. It looks like you have a follow-up, Zach. Yeah, a, a follow-up. And, and one other question we were talking about earlier, um, how these technologies would trickle down. And I'm finding now that you guys may notice I'm in a, a little bit of a, a, a pickle myself in a situation here. But some of the technology, some of the medical um, treatments they're going to be using with me, there are ones that there are newer ones that like John Hopkins University is looking at. They're having fantastic effects. But when I bring them up to the doctors, they say, yeah, they look pretty good, but we're going to go ahead and stick with the clinical stuff that we know works that we've been doing for for 10 years now that has just pretty good success. So is there any sort of role to play for insurance companies or new technology companies or uh, maybe even governments or the US Transhumanist Party to intervene in ways or, or help in ways to um, support uh, hospitals and primary care providers too, to um, try some of these innovative new therapies um, and rather than going with the tried and true, but, you know, 80% success instead of 92% success. It's unfortunate. Uh, it's a whole nother topic that you raise, but um, the, the system is basically designed to uh, ensure, if at all possible, the safety of patients. So even if a new therapy becomes available, it's it's kind of rare for it to be fast tracked they fast tracked with these emergency youth authorization you know so many of the different COVID things uh because it affected so many people but to fast track other other types of interventions be they surgical or medical or things like that the system uh the, as it exists today is just not ready for that and there are so many barriers to changing that that i think it's going to be a while before we're successful at that. I think this is a good bridge into an initiative that Jose has been involved in, which is to attempt to convince at least one government in the world to declare aging a disease, the government of El Salvador. And I have maintained over the years that the moment we have one government doing this, it will set off essentially a domino effect where other governments will be intrigued by a similar declaration and follow suit and perhaps effectuate some of these regulatory reforms which will enable the fast tracking of cutting edge medical treatments. But Jose, uh, would you like to describe your ongoing initiative? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. And um, one a quick question first also to Terry, are you working on a new book? Because as I mentioned, your two books inspired me so much that I, I want to keep on reading and probably you have many ideas. And then on my side, actually, I am working um, or will be working on the continuation of the death of death, which will be the life of life, the <laughs> life of life after the death of death, because we will have many treatments very soon. Uh, and I, and People need to know about those. So question one, quick, if you're working on a book on your own or with someone else. And number two is what Gennady mentioned. Uh, there is um, a controversy, even among people working on longevity extension, that aging can or could be considered as a disease or a curable condition. And then I have had access to the president of El Salvador, and also you speak Spanish, so maybe you can come to El Salvador with us uh, to talk to the president of El Salvador because he likes to be controversial, very visionary, futuristic. And you probably know he declared Bitcoin uh, as official tender in El Salvador last year. The first country in the planet that officially uses Bitcoin. And now I am trying to convince him uh, to declare aging as a curable condition. Uh, and that might change the world. Uh, but again, this question also for you, number two is there are different positions. Uh, do you think we should call it a disease, a condition, a curable, whatever? So 
Your answers, please, Terry. Okay, well, the first question you asked if I'm working on another book, uh, I am. It's actually a diet book. So I'm uh, working my way through this, doing a lot of research on uh, the diet that I would like to see, uh, I think it could help a lot of people, both for weight and longevity. Uh, what you mentioned about going to El Salvador and speaking with uh, Presidente there, that would be great. Uh, so I'll, I would support your efforts uh, going forward on all of these initiatives. Um, so. And, and if I, if but, I, but the point, uh, do you think aging should be considered as a disease? Uh, because, you know, there is a big uh, discrepancy. Aubrey de Grey doesn't like to call it a disease. But David Sinclair, he says it has to be a disease. So where are you? Uh, I am in the disease camp. I, I like to regard, I'm a physician, and I'm accustomed to treating diseases. Diseases are things that we can measure, we can diagnose, we can see how well our interventions are working to treat this disease. So I prefer to think of aging as a disease. I prefer to think of getting older as a natural process. We'll all get older. We've all gotten older since this, uh, this uh, seminar began, but hopefully we haven't aged during the last hour and a half or so because we're doing the right things and we're eating properly and we're engaging our brains and we're doing all these uh, engaging in fellowship and healthful things like this. But no, I agree with you, or maybe you feel differently, but my personal feeling Aging is a disease. So um, if I can quickly uh, uh, add a little bit to the topic. So uh, I've been trying to um, set up anti-aging cohort studies in Aruba, my, the island where I live, and in Colombia. And in Colombia, they're pretty interested at the University of Havariana to have basically. So the thing is now we have technology that can accurately measure aging like Terry said the true age measurement, but you also have long, deep longevities, uh, really uh, elaborate aging measurement tools, and to really do a large cohort style study where you where you're following ten thousand people, and you have two uh, and you have two groups, one who's taking an anti aging poly pill and one who's not taking an anti aging poly pill, and then and then periodically once a year or twice a year, you're measuring how fast they're aging. And if we can really show, measure that, hey, we are slowing down biological aging with a very dirty poly pill in a country like Colombia, I would love to invite Terry and Jose Cordeiro uh, to come to Colombia to speak with Havariana University's representatives. I had very nice talks with the University of Havariana representatives and to come to Colombia and uh, if we can set an, uh, set up an anti-aging cohort study in Havariana in Colombia. Yes, thank you, Simon, and thank you to Jose and Terry as well. Now, uh, my own view is I am strongly supportive of the Declaration of Aging as a Disease, so is the U.S. Transhumanist Party, but even more importantly, is the declaration of aging as something that the regulatory system would recognize as a treatable condition, whether that be a disease or anything else, as long as drugs, therapies, any of a conceivable array of medical treatments could be specifically approved for aging rather than the roundabout way that is pursued today of trying to find some very specific disease condition to target when the researchers are actually intending to target aging, but targeting the specific disease condition or combination of disease conditions is their way of getting through the regulatory system. Now our time is advancing. We have about 11 minutes left in our conversation today. I want to make sure that some of our other officers have the opportunity to ask questions or make comments. So let us go to Ben Balweg. I'll see how fast I can get this in. I was kind of looking, um, concerned with like the cost that people are looking at. Um, my question is phrased um, so Simon already answered about reasonably priced supplements, um, but for other tests and treatments that would include the carotid ultrasounds that you mentioned, Dr. Grossman, 
um, in the U.S. about what should someone in good health expect to pay annually to augment standard medical care with the kind of attentiveness that a longevity mindset requires? I like to think about <clears throat> the way that we approach our health and anti-aging as one of our favorite, if not our favorite hobby. And, <clears throat> you know, whether you're into collecting stamps or you're into like uh, Jay Leno collecting cars, there's a wide spectrum of how much money you're both willing and able to devote to your hobby. But when you look at your health and your anti-aging efforts as your hobby, you just basically decide how much you can afford to spend on this hobby. Because I can't imagine anything that's more useful and more valuable to spend your money on than have aging be your hobby. So it could be a few hundred dollars a year, it could be a few thousand dollars a year, and it could be tens of thousands of dollars a year or more. So it really just depends on your budget, but you can get a lot accomplished for not a lot of money today. That's good. Can, can I, I wanna share quick, uh, I have no financial invest, investment in this um, company, but it is by Brent Nally and it's called Longevity Plan at longevityplan.com. I've not tried it out, I've just seen it. It seems kind of interesting, but kind of about uh, guiding people to um, ostensibly reach LEV um, and guidance in that way. So if anybody knows about that, I'd be interested in hearing more about it myself. I've been following Brent Nally is a friend of mine. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah. Yes, uh, I just wanted to point out Brent Nally is a friend of mine and an avid life extension supporter. He has interviewed me before I've met him in person. I have run with him and I consider him to also be a great role model within our community. So any effort that he launches has my support. Absolutely. Now, Jason, uh, I think that's a good opportunity for you to uh, pose your question or make your comment. Um, I, I kind of got two. Uh, I'm going to Jason Mallory had a pretty good question in the chat about um, what kind of plants could we, can, is it possible? Could we like grow plants in our, in our garden that might help us to eventually be filling our longevity materials supply? And then I got a really weird question. I know you guys are all in science and everything. So, you know, <laughs> but uh, it, do you think eventually one of these days we will, through DNA or some other science, actually be able to prove whether or not ancient peoples, at least some ancient people, were long lived. And if so, what do you think the answer would be? Do you think there really was a Methuselah that lived to 900 plus? <laughs> um, well, there are some uh, plants, I mean, that you can grow. I don't know, you know, how easy it is to grow Kirk. Kirkman or not, but you know, that's uh, an amazing anti-inflammatory uh, plant. Uh, there's uh, an herb called rhodiola, full name is rhodiola rosea. Yeah, it's amazing for stress and almost everybody that I know is suffering some degree of stress or another, uh, just because of, if nothing else, the rate at which things are changing. Um, and I come from Colorado. And a lot of people out here grow cannabis and there are a lot of health benefits associated with cannabis. So, you know, whether you get the one that's just got CBD in it and it doesn't have the THC in it, which has the psychoactive effects. I think that that's, uh, it's basically, there's a reason they call it weed. It's really easy to grow. So uh, it's easy to do that. In terms of ancient people and their longevity, you know, I don't know of any change that's occurred to our telomeres between the flood and now, Noah's Ark flood. Uh, so they say that prior to the flood, people lived for centuries and centuries and centuries. I like to think that maybe it makes sense that they measured years the way we measure months. So when they say that someone lived 960 years, maybe that was more like whatever eight is into 960, 100 and some odd years. So um, that's personally how I think of it. I don't think people throughout history 
tended to live longer than we're living today uh, just because they didn't have access to clean water and many of the other things uh, that we have. Some people, you know, they did live to 100 and beyond, but I don't think their maximum longevity was any greater than what we can achieve today. So, that's very, very interesting. Um, and you say that the telomeres back in the flood were the same length? Because that would lead me to believe that there, it's not because you would think that it would take more than just a few generations for them to get genetically like bred out and that the ones shortly after the flood would be a little long, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm just guessing. So I have, uh, I, think a, I have a really small remark is like I, on Jason's question, which plants you can grow. Well, you don't have to grow plants. You can just drink tea. Tea is dirt cheap. Tea is filled with polyphenols with all kinds of really beneficial substances. You have things like breakfast tea, green tea, rooibos tea, mint tea, even have like, you know, tea mixtures that use like um, uh, strawberry leaves mixed with mint and all kinds of those teas. They're dirt cheap. They cost like $1 for, for 20 tea bags. And you get like, I, I personally consume 10,000 milligrams of polyphenols each day through tea. Although it does have some advantages that you often have to go to the bathroom, but uh, I get my po I get enough polyphenols, believe me. Yes, and we have an interesting observation on the subject uh, that Jason raised from Mike Lazine, and I agree with him. The problem with long-lived people in the Bible is that there's no outside proof. They lived long outside of the Bible and no archaeological evidence that we could evaluate. Uh, I wish there were a, a Methuselah who lived 969 years because that would be a proof of concept that such uh, lengths of lifespans are possible. But uh, I'm not aware of any archaeological evidence that we could study in this regard. Suffice it to say, the story of Methuselah is a good illustration for those who are Christians. And I'm an atheist, by the way. But for those who are Christians, it is a good illustration that their uh, holy books support the idea of longer lifespans being feasible. And Methuselah seems to be viewed quite positively uh, within the book of Genesis. Uh, so why not aspire to uh, those lengths of lifespans for those who are alive today? Now uh, we have about three minutes remaining. Art Ramon, do you have a brief question or comment that you would like to pose? Uh, yes, uh, I've read a lot about the Hella cell line, which are immortal cells uh, from a Henrietta Lack, and but I've never heard of any uh, you know longevity researcher using these. Uh, is there a problem uh, with getting access to those immortal cells, the Hella cells? Uh, you know, and if it were possible to get some, is it? You know, could you use the uh, the mitochondria for some sort of uh, stem cell uh, therapy? You know, kind of a, a mitochondria transplant uh, using my cells, getting rid of the mitochondria of my cells, but using the heloline mitochondria and using and having those replace it. So, any any ideas on the heloline cells? I don't think there's any reason that. Uh, a legitimate researcher couldn't have access to the Henrietta Lacks breast cancer cell line that's been around for a long time. Um, I don't know that we have the technology to tease out the mitochondria from those cells. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's available uh, right now. And I don't think you'd even need that specific cell line uh, since, and I don't think that the, I don't think it's the mitochondria in, the, in, in that cell line that grants them immortality. I think it's, it's as much to do with the, uh, the, the, the fact that they express telomerase very, very uh, avidly. And every time a bit of telomere length comes off, they replace it. But uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. All right, well, thank you to uh, all of our 
panelists and our guests and our audience members as well. Uh, we've had quite an engaging session today about the death of death, and it was a wide-ranging conversation on both the trajectory of our species, hopefully toward longevity escape velocity, notwithstanding uh, some of the obstacles and challenges along the way, but also some eminently practical advice with low barriers to entry that was provided. And I would encourage every one of our viewers to maintain a hopeful outlook with regard to your personal survival, your personal ability to reach longevity escape velocity, whether you're older or younger, whether you have uh, certain underlying conditions or not, because there are opportunities for you and there are incremental steps that you can take to better your well-being. And I would like to thank Dr. Terry Grossman, Dr. Jose Cordero, and Simon Waslander for all of your contributions today. This was truly a phenomenal session and definitely within the spirit of our virtual enlightenment salons it was a wide-ranging cross-disciplinary conversation and all of our viewers can take something away from it we aim to do this every sunday at 1 p.m u.s pacific time 4 p.m eastern time and until next sunday and hopefully indefinitely thereafter live long and prosper yeah.